The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Fleet Europe webinar about the rising success and the growing importance of SUVs in the corporate fleet market. My name is Steven Schoofs, Chief Editor of Fleet Europe. The information shared within this webinar is subject to disclaimers, which can be viewed in detail via the recording of this session, which will be shared afterwards on our website, fleeteurope.com. In recent years, the market share of the SUV segment, sport utility vehicles, has continued to increase until it becomes the most important vehicle segment for true fleets in Europe's biggest markets. And this with well over 20% of the market in 2016. And based on some recent research, also in 2017, the SUV and crossover segments continue to boom and become even more prominent in large fleets. How explain this SUV success? We are really happy that this Today in this webinar, we have four expert speakers that will explain you in detail the success of the SUV segment, the technological and the model evolution, and how in user-chooser policies, SUVs can be a cost-efficient, a safe, and a very pleasant to drive motivator for your employees. And so beneficial for both the employer and the car fleet drivers. The program of today is that first we will have a deep dive into the European fleet market with the segmentation and the evolution in fleet with the growth of the SUVs. Afterwards, we will go into the expanding offer in the SUV segment, some models and powertrains with attention for fuel efficiency. And finally, of course, and that's also a very important aspect, we will have a look at the total cost of ownership and the residual value forecast of SUVs. We will end the webinar with a little Q&A in which you can participate. The only thing that you have to do is send your question via the chat function of this webinar room. And afterwards, during the Q&A, we will select the most interesting questions and hand them over to our expert speakers. So let's start now with a look at the evolution of the SUV market in Europe. Our first expert speaker is Mr. Michael Gergen. He is Account Manager International for Intelligence Data Provider Dataforce. Michael, good morning. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, I can. I can. Okay, so we would like to know a little bit more about how the SUV market in Europe and then also with corporate fleets has evolved in recent years and what we can, let's say, uh, detail about the market specifics. So if you can share a little bit of that information for us, then I will hand over now the webinar floor to you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Stephen, and uh, hello everyone. Yeah, let's have a look on a few figures because that's, that's our world. Um, today we're quite used to the fact that the SUV segment is really going well and strong, not only when it comes to private customers, but also in the area of company cars, so what we usually call as true fleets. But um, that hasn't always been the case. So as we see on the first slide, it's always almost an historical one because we're uh, comparing figures for the first four months of 2009. At that time, the true fleet market in Europe was clearly dominated by compact cars, the middle class segment and the small ones. So SUV at that time only ranked on fourth position. And, Although there was already a slight increase at that time, if you look on the figures, it's still with a share below 10%, which sounds almost a bit ridiculous from today's perspective. That was the situation back at that time. But since then, the SUV was really, really growing. And that's visible on the next slide. So starting back in 2008 with a share below 10%, it was growing year on year. 
And finally, the SUV segment became number one um, in 2016. And as you can see, the line has only one direction. At the same time, if we briefly look on the other um, segments, the compact cars were still pretty stable, I would say. The same is true for the small ones, but it's especially the red line, the middle class, which is under pressure, no doubt. Um, certainly also a bit the vans, the blue line, it would look much worse if we would exclude, for example, France, where the vans are still very popular. So overall, it's, it's clear to see that the SUV really are going well and reaching now a share of uh, more than 25%. And you might maybe wonder if that might be a result only of one or two markets where SUV are really pushing, but that's not the case. Um, so as you see on this slide, it's a trend across the whole of Europe. Um, so even on the market, like Denmark, for example, on the left-hand side, a market which is a bit special, it's still a lot of small cars or even mini cars in fleet, which might be surprising, but that is due to the taxation over there. But even in Denmark, we have a share of more than 15% for the SUV nowadays. And on the right-hand side, you see markets like Switzerland, Norway, or Sweden, where we have definitely more than 30% of all new car registrations in true fleet, which belong to an SUV or crossover model. But um, maybe more impressive than the share itself is the development. If you look on France, we see a share growth of 18 percentage points. That's, that's really massive. And it's even more in a market like the UK or in Sweden. So that's definitely uh, a success story. And if we go one slide ahead, um, it's impressive that even that growth is accelerating over the time. So although the comparison volume from last year is also growing year on year, nevertheless, the growth is even accelerating. So between 2013 and 14, we had an increase of 2.8 percentage points and then followed by 3.2 and then even 3.4. So the speed is really accelerating. And I've added a few models which had a significant role at that time. So in these years, uh, partly new entries, partly a new generation of a already existing model uh, and partly a few uh, facelifts. And in general, what we call model events, so uh, new entries, facelifts, new generations, that is definitely playing a significant role. Um, and at uh, today, we have such a huge amount of different models which are available from all kind of manufacturers and all different kind of, of different sizes of SUV. So the product offer is already quite strong today. So if we, uh, yeah, if we move ahead one slide, just to give you an indication how different things have become. In Germany, um, back, it's again, historical figures, but in January 2001, you had only three models which were representing almost half of the SUV true fleet market in Germany. So you had the M-Class of Mercedes, Mitsubishi Pajero and the first generation of X5 from BMW, they were representing almost half of the SUV segment at that time. Today, July 2017, you need already 10 different models to achieve a, uh, a comparable amount of the market. So things are very diverse. Of course, talking about Germany, you still find uh, a lot of models from the German premium brands like Audi, BMW, or Mercedes. But in the top 10, you also find models from Ford, from Skoda, from Nissan. So things have dramatically changed over the last few years. And uh, it's even more interesting if you compare what's happening in the SUV segment against more, let's say, traditional vehicle segments. And that's, uh, you can see over here, what happened in the last two, three years. What we did here, we are looking on models with a significant volume in 2016 or 17, which have not been in the market in 2014. 
And you see there are a few in compact cars. The Fiat Tipo has been introduced. You have the Ionic from Hyundai or the Infiniti Q30. In the same period, you only had one single new entry in the van uh, segment with the two series Active and Grand Tourer from BMW. And at the same time, 16 new entries in the SUV world. And, and what's also impressive, at least from my perspective, you see a few brands introducing SUV which had never such a car before. So you see Alfa Romeo, you see a Jaguar with the F-Pace, you see a brand like Maserati or Seat, which had never such a model in their portfolio before. So that's definitely um, a completely different world if you compare SUV against all other car segments in the market. And this is a look backwards. And if we do the same kind of analysis now for the future, yeah, let's say it won't be a sensation uh, if you would expect that the SUV segment will still grow in 2018, 2019. Because again, it's not very much happening in the traditional segments. And although you might think we have already such a huge amount of models in SUV, there's still a lot more to come. And we just see it. I mean, we have been on the Frankfurt Motor Show the last few days. And again, it's all about SUV, small, mid-size. Um, there's a lot more to come. And as this segment has become so large, we thought it might uh, make some sense to, to split the SUV segment in yeah, some sub-segments. Just to understand a bit more about uh, where is the growth coming from at the moment. And as you can see, it's especially the compact SUV um, group, representing currently more or less exactly half of the SUV market, 50% and, and massively growing over the last few years. And when we talk about True Fleets EU7, that means it's the, the big fives so of France, Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, plus Belgium and the Netherlands. So overall, it's not only the compact SUV, also the other ones, smaller ones, bigger ones, also have growing figures over the last five years. But it's again, especially the SUV compact segment, which is dominating. And of course, it's the question, okay, what do we mean with small compact? I have just listed the top five models based on the full year 2016. So the compact segment is led by Nissan Qashqai, VW Tiguan, Kajar from Renault, Ford Cougar and Kia Sportage. So that's the group that we would interpret or define as, as compact. Um, so that's the current uh, situation when it comes to sub-segments within the SUV world. Um, maybe the last point I would like to address is some people think that the growing success of SUV is not very helpful when it comes to uh, achieving to reach certain emission targets. So people think, ah, okay, that's really bad because you have to reduce CO2 and all that stuff. And at the same time, you have a growing success for SUV especially. But it's not, not a contrast from my point of view. And what we did was just a very quick analysis looking on the share of alternative fuel types within the SUV segment compared to the average across all kinds of models. And that might be surprising, the share of, and that's the combination of full electric, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, the share of these kinds of cars is higher than on the average across all segments. Uh, and that's again, nothing which might be only coming from one or two markets. Now it's again a trend across Europe. Um, so if you look at the big seven, that is true for all of these markets. And on the right hand side, you see the top uh, 10 list of models with an alternative fuel type. Um, and that list is led by, by Toyota with the CHR and RAV4. And you see it's followed by Mitsubishi and Lexus models. Um, so that is, and maybe it's some kind of, of conclusion overall. From my point of view, we have seen, yes, SUV is really on the rise. It's a trend across the whole of Europe. Still a lot more to come. 
And last but not least, I think alternative fuel types on one hand and SUV on the other side is not a contrast. Uh, it might be even a really good combination to have yeah, the best of both worlds, so to say. Yeah, so that's overall um, our look at the current trend across, across Europe. Um, yeah, I hope I was able to give you a bit of interesting insight in, in our world of figures. Um, so that's at the moment from my point of view. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Gergen, uh, for your insight and also a view on the evolution and the forecast of the SUV segments in uh, the main markets in Europe. Um, <clears throat> as we will now dive into a little bit uh, more detail about what will come up and what can you expect in terms of alternative powertrains in uh, the SUV segment. We have found the ideal partner to explain us that, as you also see on this slide. Uh, we have found Toyota Lexus to give us more insight in what is happening. And so I would like now to introduce two expert speakers um, who are going to detail a little bit more how they see the evolution of the SUV segment also related to alternative powertrains and the European situation. So I would like to welcome both Dave Kussel, General Manager Fleet and Leasing at the Automotor Europe, and Greg Fair Service, Senior Manager at the Automotor Europe. Gentlemen, I hope that you can hear me and that you have a good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. So um, it's really nice that Toyota can support this webinar about SUVs. As, I can, uh, as we have seen already, um, Toyota Lexus is really a major car manufacturer when it comes to those SUVs. And so uh, together with the audience, I am interested to know uh, what kind of new developments uh, you have for us as corporate fleet managers. Okay, Stephen, thank you and welcome everyone uh, from Brussels. Um, just before we get, do a deep dive into SUVs, uh, what I just wanted to pick up on was the point that Michael made uh, just now from Dataforce, uh, just how uh, much influence now hybrid has uh, both in the fleet uh, sector and in particular the corporate channel, together with the influence that we're seeing, uh, as he just demonstrated, in the uh, SUV uh, sector. Um, press are constantly focusing now on, uh, on the hybrid story. Uh, quite recently in a fleet news publication in the UK, uh, for example, it was stated that many current diesel drivers, uh, company car drivers, now have hybrid on their shopping list as their first uh, powertrain alternative when considering uh, their next uh, car. So maybe this is not uh, surprising with the pressure on, uh, on CO2 and BIK, uh, but I think it clearly demonstrates that hybrid is now uh, a mainstream powertrain alternative for company car drivers, both for the driver and uh, for the fleet uh, operator. Interest in hybrid is already reflected uh, by buying patterns of fleet customers across Europe. And for example, uh, fleet registrations of hybrid have increased by almost 50% during the first seven months of this year compared to 2016, uh, last year. And uh, outsells pure EV by a factor of currently 10 to one. Across Europe, Toyota have now sold more than 1.5 million hybrids and globally over 10 million hybrids. Lexus on the other hand uh, has also now topped 1 million registrations and in Europe Lexus remains the only brand to offer hybrid powertrain across its entire range. Hybrid now accounts for almost one in two Toyota sold in Western Europe in the corporate channel whilst almost 100% of all Lexus vehicles sold in Western Europe are hybrid. We have a long uh, held view that hybrid powertrains are suited to the fleet SUV segment. We introduced Europe's first hybrid SUV, the RX, in uh, 2000. 
and to share with you more detail on our SUV strategy moving forward, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Craig Fairservice. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, I'm uh, Craig Fairservice, responsible for SUV marketing uh, for Toyota in Europe. Um, we just heard from Dave that hybrid is now the number one powertrain alternative to diesel amongst many drivers when considering their next vehicle. And this interest or this huge interest in hybrid technology is driven by several factors in no particular order. A real desire, firstly, to lower emissions. And here, it's not just about CO2, it's emissions in general. Secondly, uh, changes to tax taxation across Europe, which we can see uh, exponentially uh, growing uh, as we go into the future. And number three, an extended vehicle of hybrid vehicles uh, from, from ourselves and from, from competitors, giving the customers a wider choice. And number four, last but not least, the driving pleasure that a customer gets when driving a hybrid vehicle in comparison to a conventional powertrain. We recognize that to make hybrid mainstream in the fleet market, we needed to provide a more comprehensive offer. And that's why 20 years ago, we started introducing the pioneering Prius. And since then, we've continued to introduce more pioneering hybrid models. That hybrid offer extends, uh, it represents around 47% of our corporate sales by volume in the MM5 today. The introduction of the RAV4 hybrid and the CHR hybrid together with our premium performance hybrids, the Lexus RX and the NX, means that Toyota has Europe's most comprehensive hybrid range. And although I can't share all of the details today, I can tell you that we are not done yet. You can expect our SUVs and hybrid range to continue to expand for years to come. We understand that for many fleet and corporate drivers, the vehicle they drive is, is very important. It's often more than just transport. It's seen as a reward, a status symbol, and recognition for a job well done. We've seen a rapid expansion of SUV sales from what was a niche a decade ago to a mainstream consideration for fleet drivers. And this combination of an elevated driving position, intelligent packaging, and attractive styling, which is giving the adventure feeling of SUV, is the obvious choice for many drivers. It's also understandable why SUVs are attractive to fleet, offering stronger residual values than traditional C and D segment vehicles. Combine that with the uplift in the RVs achieved by hybrids, and you can easily understand why our all new Toyota CHR hybrid achieves the best in class RVs across Europe. While RAV4 and Lexus RX and NX also perform extremely strongly. Strong RVs are good news for fleet operators and great news for drivers. As fleet operators, the ability to future-proof the vehicle portfolio against changes in legislation and taxation is very important. Arval's Corporate Vehicle Observatory Barometer, which covers almost 4,000 fleets, recently revealed that almost 80% of larger fleets either include or plan to include alternative powertrains in their vehicle portfolio. Whilst Richard Ham Hamilton, head of pricing and risk at Zenith, that leaves that over the next 10 years, a combination of hybrid and plug-in hybrids will become the primary fuel type of choice. Running a balanced vehicle portfolio in key fleet and corporate marketplace, challenges and against the challenges for diesel vehicles are well documented. Whilst the adoption of pure electric vehicles has been slow due to ch challenges with charging infrastructure, range, but also RVs, particularly around the dis uh, discussion of battery leasing versus ownership. As hybrid faces none of these ch challenges, RVs are more stable, reducing risk 
across uh, a fleet operator's vehicle portfolio. Of course, we recognize there's still work to, be, to do to ensure that Toyota and Lexus hybrid models appear on fleet lists. And together with our dedicated Toyota Plus fleet team, we're working very closely with both existing and new fleet and corporate customers to deliver solutions that mean our hybrid models become an incre increasing segment within their fleets. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. Um, I hope it's kind of clear. Uh, of course, we're humble players in the, uh, in the fleet sector, uh, but I, our strategy to provide a full range of cars and commercial vehicles in Europe is starting to pay off. From IGO through to Land Cruiser, from CT through to LX, and now with a strong lineup of LCVs, we increasingly have, a, 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 and an increasing range of hybrid powertrains, we believe that everything is in place to support the company car driver and the fleet policyholder. Our fleet customers clearly are growing. In 2015, for example, the TME fleet team here handled on average just one RFP per month. Today, that number has increased fourfold, and we are now processing one RFP per week. Our strategy to extend our hybrid range with particular attention to the SUV segment is proving popular. And those of you who were at the IAA in uh, Frankfurt this week would have, clear, would have seen our clear point of differentiation uh, on the stand with a clear presentation of hybrid throughout uh, the range. Toyota and Lexus deliver the hi hybrid SUVs that drivers want with the TCO costs that OPLs demand underpinning Toyota's QDR. As we say internally, Toyota and Lexus hybrid always charged, always ready. When it comes to SUVs, hybrid is now and is uh, Toyota is ready. Thanks everyone uh, for listening and uh, feel free anytime to uh, make contact with us. Thank you very much, uh, both Dave and Greg. Uh, really interesting insights about uh, the developments in terms of SUVs and alternative powertrain uh, at Toyota and Lexus. Um, I'm sure that the participants, they will have questions, so don't hesitate to send your questions for our expert speakers by using the chat function in the webinar room. And so um, we already saw a little bit the evolution of the market. We also discussed a little bit uh, why and how um, SUVs can be beneficial for your fleet and can also be green in terms of uh, their fuel efficiency and in terms of the CO2 emissions. Of course, one important aspect that we have to discover is also uh, elements related to the total cost of ownership and residual values. And we have invited Magnus Lovzund from, uh, from uh, Autovista Group to explain us a little bit more how he sees, let's say, the evolution of the total cost of ownership equation for SUVs. So um, let me now give the webinar floor to Magnus. Magnus, um, I hope that you can hear me. And uh, we are, of course, interested also to see what is happening in terms of RVs and total cost of ownership when it comes to SUVs. Good morning, Stephen. And thank you for that. I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you to the previous speakers. Very, very interested indeed. Um, so let's have a look at um, my session of, of this webinar. Um, I figured I will go through just Autovista Group in very, very short. Um, and obviously before looking at residual value development, one has to look at new car registrations. Might be a bit of a repetition from what Michael explained in the beginning. Um, and, and after that, we'll have a look at the total cost of ownership. So, Autovista Group, we provide specification, valuation, repair and maintenance data. We do so over 30 countries, uh, mainly in Europe, but we also have uh, Australia. Uh, we're trading under the group name Autovista Group, uh, but we also have uh, well-respected brands such as Glasses, Schwacke, Eurotax and Autovista. And currently, we employ roughly eight, 800 uh, employees. Um, 
there's just to to make something clear and um, to start with uh, we've heard a lot of different kind of, of uh, segmentations um, I believe that Michael mentioned the mid segment and uh, should be the normal and traditional fleet segment um, we at Optivista group we call this segment the D segment um, and that would include vehicles such as the uh, 3 Series from BMW, uh, the A4, Ford Mondeo and so forth. The DSUV segment would include vehicles like the X3 from BMW, uh, the Macan from Porsche and the uh, Q5 from Audi. So as I mentioned before looking at residual values we'll have to look at what is actually being sold on the new car market um, and because that will obviously be what, what will be um, available on the used car market in the future. Um, I can only conclude what, what Michael from Data Force explained in the beginning. We can see across at least the big five markets, we can see a big increase in new car sales. Um, in the Graphs below, you will see a long-term average to give you a sense of the, uh, of the long-term trend. Um, and in the table below, you will see the actual year-to-date numbers. And that's year-to-date uh, from July this year. Um, what we can, can see is uh, there's no doubt SUVs, and especially in the DSUV segment, comparing that to the uh, traditional passenger car from the same size and utility um, that is that is taking over completely. Um, you can see a, a, a drop in, and, and that was also confirmed by Michael earlier, you can see a drop in the normal traditional uh, D-segment passenger cars. You see Germany, big numbers, uh, minus 35 percent. Um, you also see minus 18 in Italy, for example. Um, and in the opposite direction uh, goes the, um, the SUVs. So there's no doubt that SUVs are really taking over. And the question is then what will happen to residual values with increasing volumes? Um, to give you a little bit of a flavor on the development, um, we have, uh, we have um, pulled a few numbers on a, a normal D-segment vehicle versus a DSUV segment vehicle is diesel. And uh, we have been looking at the 36, a 36 month old with 90,000 kilometers on the clock. Uh, these are trade values in percentage. And what we can see is clearly a, a stable development. Um, we can't see anything, again, there's a diesel. There's another topic on, on diesel development. What we can see currently is that there's, there's nothing to, to be worried about um, currently. Um, as I said, a stable development, and we can clearly see, also confirmed by, um, or stated by Toyota earlier, that it has a definitely a, um, a premium on the uh, second-hand market um, if you buy DSUV segment rather than a traditional D segment passenger car. If we move to the next slide, um, if you look at TCO performance, we can see, and, and this is then the acquisition cost plus the utilization cost, we can clearly see that across um, not only big five European markets, but across nine markets, that we have a better TCO performance for all of them except for Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, TCO is heavily, heavily um, split by, by taxation and depreciation. The reason for Belgium and the Netherlands to be to have a stronger TCO for normal D-segment vehicles is, is due to the taxation. So in the Netherlands, for example, you have a, um, a luxury tax, which is then based on CO2 and the list price. And this is then higher on uh, for a traditional DSUV vehicle, which then makes the total cost of ownership slightly more um, or quite a bit more expensive. And obviously what makes the TCO calculation attractive would be the depreciation. And this is again something that we see across all the markets, uh, once again, except the Netherlands. This is a lot stronger um, 
throughout Europe. Fuel cost is going to be um, less consistent. We see a rough comparing than a a like for like vehicle. We see a um, we see a very um, consistent trend. You will have um, an SUV would be have a higher ride um, and and thus um, will consume more um, fuel. So if we move to the next slide, as I mentioned, total cost of ownership, that is the acquisition cost plus the utilization cost. Um, we've simulated this in, in what we call car cost expert. We're then using several layers of calculation logic just to enable the, uh, the correct generation of the, of the ownership costs. Um, as mentioned, when doing this calculation, we have been looking at like for like, meaning a similar vehicle in two different segments, although in the same size segment. Um, they are both four-wheel drive, uh, they have a comparable engine output, and they all have automatic gearbox. So the only thing different is the fact that one is a normal passenger car and the other one is an SUV. Um, and the scenario is over 36 months with 90,000 kilometers. Um, we have assumed, based on uh, market research, that a, an SUV will have a slightly lower percentage discount than a passenger vehicle. Um, passenger vehicle, <clears throat> uh, passenger vehicle will uh, will have a, a higher discount, um, much supported by the uh, new car registration numbers, with a declining development of um, of traditional passenger vehicles compared to SUVs. We'll, we'll definitely see a lower or higher discount. And, and this is certainly something that will um, that will move forward. And to repeat, in seven out of nine markets that we have been looking at, um, we can definitely see a better TCO performance um, compared to than the, the equivalent passenger vehicle. Um, what is then reducing TCO in certain markets? That would be um, the taxation rules, and and the. The good example in, in this case was the Netherlands. Um, what is and, and the biggest factor for a higher residual value would be the depreciation, where we can see then a more attractive, um, more attractive offer seems then to be the SUV consumers as well as, as fleets. They are definitely looking for an SUV rather than a uh, traditional passenger vehicle. This is something that is based on, on as, as also mentioned by the previous speakers, um, has become more of a status symbol. You have a higher ride, you can clearly see the, your your environment, and it's 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 um, something that is um, is being offered more and more from from all OEMs. Um, I think that was that was it. What I had to present um, to conclude. We can say definitely SUVs, they do have a healthy um, healthy total cost of ownership development. Um, and, and the only thing reducing it would be certain taxation in specific markets. So thank you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer any questions from the audience. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus, for your insights and the residual value forecasting and some TCO aspects. Um, as mentioned, we will now go into our final part of this webinar, and that is a little Q&A with all our expert speakers. So I'm going to unmute the expert speakers again so that they can hear us and also take the speaking rights when there is a question for them. Um, I have already a question, uh, I think, for Dave. In, uh, it's for sure for Toyota Motor Europe. And the question is straightforward. Um, Dave, you mentioned in your presentation that also in the future you will further expand your model range in terms of SUVs and crossovers. The question is, what will be the next SUV model that we can expect from Toyota Lexus 
and what will be the next evolution with regard to alternative powertrain models in SUVs from Toyota Lexus? Thanks, Stephen. Actually, I think it's a question for Craig, not for Dave. But uh, <laughs> uh, needless to say, uh, needless to say, uh, we're not in a position to uh, talk about future product plans, uh, other than to reassure uh, our fleet uh, customers uh, that uh, it, it will be part of a continual expansion. I, I think our previous record shows the, quite clearly uh, our, our commitment to uh, hybrid, uh, and I think uh, for those of that know our product range well, uh, probably they could even uh, forecast for themselves uh, which models are coming uh, next. Uh, I think very much like Lexus, uh, our plan uh, in, the, in the medium term, let's say, is to have a hybrid in uh, all of our uh, product range. Okay. Sorry, I can't uh, be Okay, and next question, that is one for Michael and perhaps afterwards Magnus, uh, based on your presentation, you can also give a little feedback. Um, the question comes from a fleet manager who asks, uh, based on your insights, are there any markets in Europe where you can say today that uh, having SUVs in your car policy, in your fleet policy, is a must because the appetite is so big. Yeah, interesting, interesting question. I don't think that there is a real must to have it. I mean, it's depending a bit about um, the structure of the fleet. If you have a lot of, let's say, user chooser, for example, what's definitely interesting is the what happened over the last few years because I remember clearly that based in Germany now in a lot of car policies these kind of cars were really excluded and it's not that long ago where i said okay we have a certain range of models which are allowed which are part of the car policy but definitely not a sports car not a an suv not a uh, a convertible in pink as a as a company car that has dramatically changed and of course, sometimes it's it's not easy to define, is that a proper SUV, not to speak an off-roader, if you see especially some of the small cars which are just appealing as an SUV, but in the whole rest is definitely more a typical small car. So to, to sum that up, I don't think that's a, a real must. It's maybe driven uh, by the company car drivers themselves. I mean, they will demand this kind of car. Um, and I can only recommend as, as a f and being a fleet manager, if there is a demand coming from the drivers, there should be some reason to keep them happy. Let's, let's put it this way. Okay, thank you. Um, Magnus, based on your figures um, and your insights, um, can you give a little bit more detail about uh, this question? Do you see, for example, that it can be a must in a certain market? Um, I would probably have to agree with, with Michael there again. I would definitely say that if there is a user chooser, then it would um, it would definitely makes sense. Um, what we can also see is with the constant inflow of new uh, SUV models to the markets, the these models, they are sharing so many components from the equivalent um, passenger vehicle um, that they are not more um, more expensive to uh, um, to keep in your fleet. Um, the, uh, once again, the only thing that would um, that would speak against it would probably be the, the emissions. Um, if you, as a fleet, has a certain um, a certain CO2, for example, target, then that might be um, restricting your your SUV choice. So that would be the only thing. Okay, good. Um, quite some interesting questions coming in uh, for Toyota Motor Europe. So, gentlemen, uh, hold your seats. Uh, the first one is. Uh, related to the expansion of your hybrid engine range. The question is, are you going to offer a wider hybrid engine range with different power outputs per model? 
Um, it's Dave again. I, uh, I think for those of you that uh, had the chance uh, to see our uh, uh, presentation at the uh, IAA earlier this week, uh, it's quite a clear intention. Uh, we showed uh, a concept uh, CHR on the stand uh, that clearly demonstrates our uh, interest in moving uh, to have a wider range of uh, hybrids, high power, uh, uh, and more economic uh, hybrids uh, as we have today in our range. So for sure, it's a it's a direction that you can expect uh, from Toyota. Craig, yeah, I think uh, supporting what Dave said, but also in addition, every generation of vehicle we bring out and every generation of hybrid powertrain we bring out, we learn and we improve. So even uh, on the base engines themselves, uh, you can see from generation to generation significant improvements of power. NV, NVH drivability of the cars and, and we can see from customer feedback again more and more appreciation of the new hybrid powertrains that are coming out. So uh, I think you, you, you can expect from Toyota and from Lexus uh, a further rollout. Okay, um, another question is um, related to um, the fact that we talk here in this webinar about SUVs and also about alternative powertrain and it may seem that there is quite some let's say focus on everything that has to do with alternative powertrains since a few years now however it seems that let's say the vehicle development goes faster than the implementation of for example the charging stations and the infrastructure for such vehicles so for Toyota do you also foresee playing a role, let's say, to uh, yes, serve your fleet customers and uh, support, let's say, the wider expansion of the infrastructure of charging stations and so on? Yeah, this is already happening. I mean, if you look at the other e e end of the scale towards uh, fuel cell, uh, Toyota last year opened uh, all of its patents to the other to other OEMs in order to speed up the uh, implementation of fuel cell, which uh, for us uh, is a kind of clear stance that uh, hybrid uh, EV is all part of a journey towards uh, uh, fuel cell, which which is the way we see the future. Other, other OEMs may, may see it uh, differently. So I, I think there is um, lobbying uh, going on. Um, if I speak just here in Brussels, uh, where we're based, we now have uh, two uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell stations uh, 12 months ago. We had none. So there's a, a slow migration uh, in, in that uh, aspect. And uh, of course, in terms of um, uh, juice points for uh, plug-in or for pure EV, uh, we're also uh, part of the, the process of uh, increasing expansion in that uh, area. So uh, it's a slow uh, pro process, and it's why I suppose we really consider um, hybrid today as the as the serious alternative to uh, regular combustion engines, gasoline or, or diesel, uh, because it is today the car uh, that, at least for the fleet customer, uh, makes the most uh, sense according to us. Okay, um, an interesting question, and perhaps one. Uh, with uh, what we should have started this webinar with. Uh, I'm going to ask it to Michael Gergen of Dataforce. Uh, the question is quite simple. What is the true definition of, a, of an SUV? And if there is one, uh, yes, is there one? Is there something like the true definition of the SUV? <laughs> That's what you call a simple question, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably we could spend a, another webinar for let's say a few days to to clearly define about what is an SUV and what's not. Um, it, it's in fact a really complicated thing because you have not very much different opinions when it comes to defining a small or a mini car. You can just take a, a certain length of a car, a certain height. That's definitely different uh, when it comes to SUV and. Um, so at the moment, you would find within what we call an SUV, uh, also cars like the, the 500X from, from Fiat, for example. 
So at the moment, the definition is, is rather wide, I would say. Um, and it, but it's a tough, it's a tough decision, and it's tough discussions also internally. I think it's also and there's no common sense also across the OEMs. Sometimes you have a feeling that there is a more a, a marketing SUV than a real one. But uh, yeah, so far based on our figures that we have, we partly take the data that we get from the authorities that we collect over there, but we're also working on a on a, our own definition. But I, I would say the SUV definition is, is really wide when we look on our figures. So it's not very strict. Okay. Um, a question uh, related to an aspect that we perhaps haven't uh, underlined in this webinar. Um, I will ask it first to Magnus and then perhaps Greg or Dave, you can uh, follow up on that. The question is related to um, safety performance. Um, is there any analysis comparison that you can make in terms of uh, SUVs being more or less safe, et cetera, than let's say the traditional passenger cars that we know in corporate fleets uh, based on, for example, uh, NCAP ratings or on other studies? Is there any information that you can give? And we start with Magnus. Um, I mean, th this is not data that we really um, provide. Um, I think, I think generally, tra traditionally, an SUV has been safe uh, from a, from a crash uh, crash safety point of view because it has been a large vehicle. Um, also, traditional traditionally, that SUV has been um, say based on on a um, on, on an LCV platform. I think that is that is something that is um, that has passed, um, and nowadays they would they would be designed on a proper platform, um, and they will have the same safety features as a modern car. Um, the the benefit would then be that you're you're riding higher, um, so so for yourself as a driver, then then yes, um, it's also of course with if you would have an impact with a pedestrian um that would be say less good for a pedestrian to be hit by an suv than than a um than, than a normal passenger car but this is also something that is developing uh very rapidly most oems they're they're providing um i mean just just autonomous systems first of all but also designing hood and everything to to be kinder to the um uh, passenger uh, to pedestrians should you have such an impact Okay, uh, Greg, do you have something to add? Well, I, I can maybe add just from a from a authority perspective that from a society and care of, care of a, a driver and a greater a pedestrians and so forth, uh, we take a great care in terms of making sure that uh, people are safe. So, in terms of the basic body rigidity of, a, of an SUV is very strong, and crash performance uh, for us is key. So that's why we always aim for. Uh, top class uh, NCAP. But from also from an active safety point of view, uh, to try to avoid accidents is also very critical for us. So this is why we standardize Toyota Safety Sense across our range, uh, giving uh, 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 potential to avoid uh, accident with uh, uh, car detection, also pedestrian protection, and we continue to roll out new technologies as well uh, for nighttime also for uh, additional protection. Uh, to really ensure that we keep uh, the driver, the occupants, and pedestrians in, uh, uh, as safe as possible within this. So in terms of stability, in terms of driving performance, the cars, uh, SUVs are uh, basically in line with passenger cars today. So in terms of rollover or this type of thing, we don't see these concerns anymore. The, the car is extremely stable, extremely robust, and we put the, most, the highest safety equipment on the vehicles as standard to ensure we give the safest product to our customers and we minimize any, any negative impacts of safety. Just, uh, Stephen, just let me come in uh, on that because uh, safety is also something that's very close to my heart. We, um, we did some work about uh, 18 months ago and folk can uh, look this up for themselves, but uh, we did some work with uh, Professor Jonathan Freeman from the Goldsmith University in London and actually what uh, their study concluded, and this kind of comes back to the point of hybrid, is that um, 
a quiet car and a car with a seamless transmission resulted in less accidents. So his study, not mine, but uh, they were able to make the link between, uh, for example, hybrid uh, powertrain, a non-hybrid powertrain, and a safer driving uh, environment. So for people who are interested in this topic, I would urge them to understand that study a little bit better. Good. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, we have to end this webinar, but I have to ask one more question for the panel, uh, because it's so uh, a hot topic that we can't avoid it. And uh, let's say that uh, to define a little bit the context, um, we have seen now that car model uh, can have quite some, uh, let's say, difference when it comes to the reality of the consumption figures with what is mentioned by the car manufacturers when doing the tests. And uh, we are also, since 1 September, having the new WLTP testing procedure in place. And in the press and also some studies underlined already that this could be a disadvantage for uh, several car segments and also for hybrid technology. So the question is, for each of you, do you think that the WLTP testing could worsen the business case for SUVs due to the higher fuel consumption and the CO2s? Let's start with Michael. <laughs> I was hoping another one would start. I can just <laughs> just agree. Um, yes, it might have an impact, but on the other side, if, as we have seen, the share of alternative fuel types is already quite high in SUV. So that might be a more serious impact in other segments where you don't have such a high share of alternative fuel types. And also, and I look a bit uh, into the future, what's going to happen uh, in terms of model events. I'm quite sure that the high share of, SUV, um, of fuel types with alternative powertrains and SUV will at least stay on that level, maybe even um, have more advantage compared to classic traditional segments. And one thing that I would like to add is if we look on True Fleet as a as a certain sales channel, people really tend to forget that the average age of company cars is so much lower compared to the private ones. I mean, as a private customer, I would also be interested to have a car with a low CO2 emission. But my next decision on average for a new car would be in seven, eight years from now. So my neighbor who's driving a company car will have replaced his one at least twice or three times in the same period. So that's something which I think is definitely worth to mention. True Fleet is very good to introduce new technology just because the replacement circle is so, so fast compared to the private ones. Okay, thank you, Michael. We are now going to Magnus. Yes, um, I think when it comes to SUVs and, and um, hybrid, it's of course since an SUV has a carries a higher weight. Um, obviously, the hybrid technology also carries a a certain weight. Uh, it is popular for OEMs to introduce with um, with SUVs to introduce also a hybrid version. I think it's the biggest, um, the most important thing is to see actually just because it says hybrid on the vehicle doesn't mean that it, it's, it's actually capable of say running the car in a certain speed on in hybrid mode. Um, so I think the important uh, thing to, to realize is actually what is that uh, electric motor in the hybrid drivetrain capable of, of doing? Is it capable of um, only running the um, the air conditioning or is it actually uh, will it allow me to um, to drive the car um, on electric mode and hybrid mode at higher speeds? So that's going to be the defining factor. Okay. And then the final comment is for Toyota Motor Europe. Greg or Dave? Uh, I, I, I will start and then maybe Dave will, Dave will conclude. So I, I think uh, both uh, Michael and Magnus have touched upon most of the points. So I won't over elaborate on those, but we're, we're of course, 
looking for the future for WLTP and, and beyond, and we design our cars to be future-proof as well. So we try to take into consideration future uh, taxation changes, the requirements to enter cities, and we try to develop the most efficient vehicles as possible, uh, and, and we believe we do within each, each and every segment that we, that we go into. And taking Magnus's point in terms of uh, vehicles, in terms of the performance, what does hybrid mean? Hybrid means a lot of different things to different manufacturers and to different customers. And we have a full hybrid system. And when we test our vehicles with public and with press and with even taxi companies, we can see above 50% of the drive is in electric mode only on our hybrid vehicles. And it's showing that we really do have a very well-performing hybrid system. When it comes to the future, any detrimental impact or SUVs and, on, and hybrids, I think on, honestly, yes, there is uh, a change uh, due to the testing, uh, testing conditions, but we don't see a proportionate uh, negative impact from SUVs or from, from hybrid systems versus other models. So we expect to, to maintain uh, with alternative powertrains a, a quite a competitive advantage for uh, our vehicles themselves. And just, okay. just to add, uh, from, uh, from my, my point of view, um, since I've been around almost 100 years, I've seen the introduction of uh, BIK, and I've also seen uh, the skeptics announce that uh, BIK would be the death of the company car. Uh, I, BIK has been around for as long as I can recall, and I believe the company car is uh, still very strong and still very much part of the remuneration uh, package uh, today. So I guess ultimately the, uh, cust the company car driver and the fleet manager who uh, ensures that the car's on the policy list in the first place will be the uh, final judge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave and Greg from Toyota Motor Europe of supporting this webinar and being with us uh, today. Also, thanks to Michael Gergen of Dataforce and Magnus Lufsund of AutoVista Group. This is the end of this uh, I think very interesting webinar that we have had on uh, the success of the SUVs and for corporate fleet drivers. Um, we would like to mention that there will be a recorded version of the webinar that will be made available online on our website fleeteurope.com and that uh, of course we hope to meet with you in upcoming webinars that we will organize and one of those upcoming webinars is the International Fleet Managers Institute webinar on cash for car versus company car on the 28th of September. All information on our website. I hope that you enjoyed uh, the expert speakers and that we had a great webinar. Thank you very much and bye-bye.